Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We are going to be moving on to peripheral nervous system, nerves of steel. Oh, sorry. Hold on. Here we go. Nerves of steel was my little song to get you started here to tell you that we're going to be talking about nerves. Okay. And so peripheral nervous system is what we're going over today. You should have watched central nervous system before this. And in central nervous system, I went through the brain, the spinal cord, gray and white matter, which is the controlling part, which is the transferring part, how the brain looks, all the different areas of the brain, all those lobes, the cerebellum, the brain stem, the three parts of the brain stem, midbrain pons, medulla oblongata, the cord with the white matter on the outside, the gray matter on the inside, the transference of information on the white matter, the controlling of information on the gray matter, and how nerves come out to form nerves of the peripheral nervous system. That's what we're moving into at this point. Peripheral nervous system is going to have two major groupings. Cranial nerves, which are going to come out of the cranium or the base of the skull, and also spinal nerves, which will come out of the spine. And that's what we're going to be looking at today. I'm going to go over the general microscopic anatomy of the nerves and how they look first and then where the nerves come out and what they do, okay, and how they're structured. That's what we're doing for today. So peripheral nervous system, okay? So peripheral nervous system's whole job is to sense and to move. There's that sensory component and there's that motor component, which we've gotten a general gist of so far, okay? So we're gonna have sensory receptors, we're gonna have peripheral nerves, and we're gonna have ganglia. We've touched upon ganglia a little bit already. Ganglia are little bags that we're gonna find in the peripheral nervous system um, that contain cell bodies. So whenever you hear me talk about ganglia, there's two groupings we'll get into, two groupings. 
their bags of cell bodies. So if they're bags of cell bodies, we know that cell bodies are going to be the controllers, the integrators, the thinkers. Okay, so ganglia. And then motor endings we'll have in the peripheral nervous system control motor of the body. Okay. I'm going to bring you in on this picture because we're going to be looking at <clears throat> this is the, well, microscopic per se. You really could see this um, except for the axons with the naked eye. So this is going to be a section of a nerve. Okay. Around the outside is going to be a dense irregular connective tissue called the epineurium. And you could see a nerve is actually made up of, of hundreds of axons. And those axons would be all loose if we didn't have them contained within these groupings. And these groupings, you could see, are surrounded by connective tissue to help hold these axons in place. The connective tissue on the outside call, is called the epineurium. And quite often we use epi as a descriptive term for covering around the outside of something. Epineurium. Perineurium is another grouping, well perineurium is going to be one grouping of axons, and around that group of, of axons is going to be a dense connective tissue that's called the perineurium. It groups these axons into what are called fascicles, smaller bundles of axons. Okay. Now around the axon itself is the endoneurium. And that's going to be um, a little bit looser. I'm not sure if it's a dense or a loose connective tissue, um, but it's going to be a connective tissue that's around the axon itself. So what these little layers do is help to bundle these nerves or axons, I should say, into really workable groups to help um, cover them, protect them, and keep them from intertwining with each other. Okay, so that is the basic nerve structure. And you can see if you look really closely, the axon itself in the myelin sheath that's going to be around that axon. Okay, and in between them, you can see there are blood vessels, and those blood vessels help to nourish those nerves. Okay, so we have out in the periphery, if you think about um, air, any area in the body that's going to have nerves going to it. Okay, we have, at this point, little nerves that perform different functions, okay? And these nerves in these areas, so let's think about the palm of the hand. Let's make it a little simpler, okay? The palm of the hand, right underneath the skin or in parts of the skin, will have a whole bunch of different types of nerves, which will sense different types of information. We've got in the palm of the hand nerves that are unencapsulated and then nerve receptors that are encapsulated. And what that means is unencapsulated nerve receptors do not have any connective tissue surrounding them. The encapsulated nerve receptors will have connective tissue which encapsulates them, protects them, okay, and keeps them in one place. So, so that's a difference. So unencapsulated are basically just free nerve endings that are out there waiting, uh, waiting for a reception of information. And those unencapsulated free nerve endings include nociceptors and thermoreceptors. Now nociceptors guys receive pain and thermoreceptors receive temperature. Well, I think that's a really good idea to make those unencapsulated because if we're sensing something that is either painful, you know, we get out a knife, we stab ourselves, we need to know quickly um, that that information is dangerous. So if we have unencapsulated free nerve endings, they don't have any connective tissue to get in way of that information. We can sense really quickly that something painful has happened to us. Thermal receptors are going to sense hot and cold, but they can also tell <clears throat> the upper regions of really hot and really cold. And once again, they're quick in their response to tell us if something is going to be too hot for us to touch or too cold for us to touch. Okay, so unencapsulated free nerve endings. They're free. There's no connective tissue around them to make them quick in response to dangerous stimulation. Encapsulated nerves are going to sense pressure 
in our movement in space. So things that are not dangerous, but help us to figure out what's happening in our environment. Meisner's and Piscinian corpuscles both sense pressure. Piscinian corpuscles are gonna sense deeper pressure, okay? So that's what I want you to know about these two. They both sense pressure. Piscinian corpuscles are gonna sense deeper pressure. Muscle spindles help to sense where the muscles are in space. They help to give us a sense of where we are in our environment, okay? They also help to, with, with our movements, I should say, how long the muscle is stretched or if it's shortened, okay, muscle spindles. Golgi tendon organs are in the tendons that are near our muscles, and they help in the response if a muscle gets overstretched, okay? So they sense how long a muscle is being stretched. And they will actually create some of that response when we um, shorten a muscle, okay? So Golgi tendon organs are in tendons. They help to sense the lengthening of a muscle, okay? We also have what are called mechanoreceptors, which are gonna sense mechanical pressure. If you sit down, they help to sense the pressure as you're sitting in a chair, okay? So they kind of overlap with those Meisner's and Piscinian corpuscles, or some overlap with that. And they also help with what is called proprioception. Now, proprioception helps us to tell where we are in space. So if I were to take my hand and put my hand behind my back where I couldn't see it, because we have these little receptors that sense proprioception, I know my hand is behind me, those proprioceptors tell it, even though I can't see it. Okay, so mechanoreceptors will sense pressure, but they also deal with proprioception, that awareness of where we are in space, which is really an important concept. Two types of peripheral nerves. We have cranial nerves, there are 12 pairs that go to the head, neck, and somewhat to the chest and the stomach, or some of them, I should say. Spinal nerves, there are 31 pairs that come down the whole spine. Now there's a dorsal and a ventral root. We've talked about this before, and I'm actually going to show you a picture a little bit. I think it's a little bit further ahead. Yep. Okay. Those dorsal and ventral nerve roots are going to come right off the spinal cord. Dorsal have the sensory nerves. Ventral have the motor nerves. We went over this in lab. They come out and they form what's called a mixed spinal nerve, which has both sensory and motor nerves. Okay, so I have a picture of that I'd like to go over in a few slides, but that's the general gist of it. So when those spinal nerves come off, they're gonna have motor and sensory in them. That's why they're called mixed spinal nerves. Sensory receptors are specialized to respond to changes in their environment, okay? Activated, so we've got those graded potentials. Remember that from action potentials, okay? <clears throat> we've got those graded potentials which will ex in eventually um, get high enough. So if you can imagine, excuse me, if you can imagine um, that chart that I drew for you that shows the voltage going up, eventually those graded potentials will trigger an action potential is what that is saying in these nerves. And action potentials is what will make these nerves work, both sensory and motor, okay? Now that sensation is going to happen in the body, it's going to travel on nerves, go up the spinal cord and up to the brain, where it's sensed in that post-central gyrus, okay, so sensation. Here we go, mechanical receptors are going to respond to touch, pressure, vibration, stretch, and itch, okay, so they do more than just pressure and proprioception. Thermoreceptors will sense temperature, photoreceptors, whew, this one's easy, thank goodness, sense light, chemoreceptors will respond to chemicals, okay, those are our special senses, smell, taste, but we also have chemoreceptors in the blood, and we'll get into those in, in the future, I don't want to blow your brain, I know this is a lot today. Nociceptors are going to be sensitive to pain, okay, now pain can include extreme hot and cold, so thermoreceptors will sense temperature up to the point where it can start to damage us. And then it switches over to nociceptors and says, ooh, this is dangerous. We need to get away from this hot flame or this really cold ice that we've been holding for a long time. 
And those receptors also can sense excessive pressure. You know, if you get hit, sure, that's pressure, but your nociceptors will sense that because they will sense that damage is happening. Inflammation and chemicals, dangerous chemicals, okay? Here's a picture of that sensation coming into the spinal cord and going into that somatosensory cortex, which is the post-central gyrus. Don't forget, it's going to mostly, some nerves skip it, but most nerves go through that thalamus. Big integrator with sensation. Okay. Now, adaptation of sensory receptors. This is actually a really easy concept. When you put on, you got up this morning, you had your coffee or your tea or your water or whatever, and then you put on your clothes and you put on your rings and you put on your makeup and then you put your glasses on. Did you think all day long, well, I've got my shoes and my socks and my underwear and my bra and my shirt and my glasses and my jewelry on. Then five seconds later, I've got my shoes and my socks and my pants and my shirt and my glasses and my jewelry. No, because you adapt to that sensation. If you were to sense everything that touched your body, or if you were to think about everything that you saw every second of that day, you would lose your mind. It would be too much overload. What happens is you adapt to that sensation. Your body says after a while, okay, great, I have shoes and rings and socks and glasses on, but I'm not going to think about it all the time. I'm going to adapt to it. I'm going to realize it's there and I'm going to get used to it. It's called adaptation. Okay. You just can't think of everything all day long. You'd lose your mind. So adaptation. After a while, those sensory nerves will just turn off. They will stop firing in that reception. Now, the exception to this is going to be painful stimulation. If there is painful stimulation, okay, your body will not ignore it. It will not adapt to it. You will figure out a way to get away from it, hopefully, okay, unless you're really sick. Processing at the circuit level, this is, this is confusing if you look at it, but I'm going to draw you a picture. I'm going to make it really easy. Okay, so let's scoot on out here. Here we go. So processing at the circuit level. Um, if you just want to look through this really quickly, verbally, let's talk about it, and I'm going to draw you a picture. When, it deal, when we deal with sensation, we're going to deal with three nerves. We're going to have nerves that are going to bring that sensory information of me touching my hands into the spinal cord. Then you're going to have a nerve that's going from the spinal cord to the thalamus. And then you're going to have a nerve from the thalamus to the brain. So this looks crazy confusing when you look at it. It's really simple. Three nerves deal with sensation. Nerves will come from the peripheral into the cord. Another nerve carries in sensation from the cord to the thalamus, another nerve carries that sensation from the thalamus to the brain. So what happens is we're going to have some sort of sensation. That sensation is going to carry that information on that peripheral nerve, which is going to be known as the first order neuron. That sensory information is taken to what's called the dorsal ganglia. Okay, the dorsal ganglia is going to actually connect right into those sensory nerves that go into the back of the cord. Okay, And what that dorsal ganglia is is a collection of cell bodies that's going to connect this first order neuron to the second order neuron in the spinal cord. Okay, so first order neuron is going to go to the dorsal, um, dorsal root ganglia. I'm going to have to move this whole thing down. I don't know what I was thinking. Hold on just a second. Because I need to get up to the brain. I'm already at the top of the board. Okay, so here's our peripheral nerve also known as the first order nerve. Is that what they call it? Neuron nerve, okay. It's going to go to the dorsal root ganglia, which once again is just a collection of cell bodies for this sensation to come into the body. 
it's going to connect that first order neuron with the second order neuron. Okay, so this dorsal root ganglia is going to be right next to the spinal cord. Okay, and then this is going to connect to the second order neuron which is going to go from the ganglia in the back of the spinal cord or close to the back of the spinal cord and that second nerve is going to travel up the spinal cord. I'm going to kind of write this all down to down for you. To the thalamus. Okay. The thalamus is going to send a nerve to that to the different parts of the brain, okay? That posterior gyrus, the primary somatosensory cortex. Oh, this is tough. Okay, so let me go through this one more time. First order neuron is going to come from the periphery of the body up to the cord to that dorsal root ganglia, which is just in the back part of the cord. It's actually connected into the sensory nerves that will lead right into the cord. That dorsal root ganglia is then going to lead to the second nerve, which is going to travel right up the cord. That second nerve goes to the thalamus. The third nerve is going to start in the thalamus and go up to the postcentral gyrus. Whew, that's tough. Three nerves is what you need to remember, okay? And where they connect. Okay, tough, tough, tough. If you have any questions about that, let me know, okay? Okay, let's move on to the next part. I'm going to zoom you in on it. Classification of nerves. Most are mixed. Once again, this is going to sound like a lot of gobbledygook, but don't make it any harder than it needs to be. We've got mixed nerves out in the peripheral nervous system. Okay, there are a few exceptions. Most are mixed nerves. That means that they're going to have sensory and motor. Sensory is afferent, motor is efferent. Now, we can have somatic and visceral. So somatic means body. Visceral means organs. Because don't forget that in the peripheral nervous system, not only do we move voluntarily, all of these peripheral nerves, guys, are going to affect the organs as well. They're going to bring sensation in from the organs, whether you feel it or not. We still need to sense that we're digesting food and control that. And then we're going to have motor control over those organs as well. Heart beating, stomach digesting, etc. Okay, so this is a lot. But I think if you just define these words, you can understand it so much better. Okay? Sensory being afferent. You know what? I don't even care if you know those words. I want you to understand that there is going to be motor control that's voluntary as well as involuntary to the organs. And there's going to be sensation. And that sensation will be things that we sense, you know, from our somatic or our body. But there's also sensation coming from the organs, okay? So if you want to even cross all these crazy words out, I want you to understand the concepts. Just want you to understand those concepts, okay? So, ganglia. We just talked about the dorsal root ganglia. There's going to be a collection of cell bodies. That is going to be linked into the sensory, sensory of the body, okay? And that sensory nerve will come up to that dorsal root ganglia when we feel or touch things and then start that chain of those three nerves that will talk to the brain. We also have autonomic ganglia. We're going to talk about the autonomic nervous system next. Autonomic is automatic. It's going to be a collection of cell bodies that deal with all those automatic cell, or I'm sorry, organ functions that happen in the body. Okay, autonomic. Okay, regeneration of nerve fibers. Now here's the thing. Nerves will not, and we talked about this before, but I want to refresh your memory. R nerves will not um, mitose. You have all the nerves that you're going to have. There's one exception we'll talk about in the future forever. But if they damage, they can um, regenerate themselves or fix themselves. Okay. And what will happen is the ends of the nerves will move together. This only happens in the peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system will not fix nerves if they are damaged. Okay, and that's at the bottom there. They actually have growth inhibiting proteins that'll prevent that from happening. But in the peripheral nervous system, we have Schwann cells, and those Schwann cells will help to remove debris and regenerate axons. Okay, so just a little refresher. 
Just a little refresher for you. So cranial nerves. We've got 12 pairs of cranial nerves. They, <clears throat> okay, let me bring it out. Let me give you the little chart that I do with people. So cranial nerves. There are 12 pairs of cranial nerves that gives us our special senses and also helps control motor and sensory in the head and the neck. And there is one that will actually go down to the organs in the body. Excuse me. I'm going to give you the do, excuse me, the mnemonic for them to remember their name and to remember if they're sensory motor or both sensory and motor. Because some of these specialized nerves are only sensory, some are only motor, okay, and some have both functions. So I'm going to give you that gist, and then we're going to talk about their actual function in lab. I have an exercise to give you their actual function. Because if you look in the book, they give you lists of several functions for each cranial nerve. What I've tried to do is give you the most clinically applicable ones um, in lab, and that's where we'll review them, okay? So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 cranial nerves, okay? The mnemonic that your book gives you is on occasion our trusty truck acts funny, very good vehicle anyhow. I, I don't know why that doesn't stick to me. I do ooh, 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 to touch and feel very good. It's not gonna be dirty. Vegetables and honey. There's a dirty one online, I'm not giving it to you and honey, okay? If that mnemonic helps you, that's great. What that does is that gives you the first letter. I'm gonna let you look up the cranial nerves on your own because I've done them a million times, okay? I need to sort of move on with this lecture. That gives you the first letter of each cranial nerve, okay? Olfactory, oculomotor, optic, etc. I should transpose those. Olfactory, optic, oculomotor, etc., etc. okay? So I'm gonna let you do those on your own. But that gives you the first letter of each of the cranial nerves. The next thing is a mnemonic to tell you whether they're sensory motor or both. Some, I'll put it right next to this one. Some say money, sensory, sensory motor, money matters, but my brother, says big business means more. There, I've given you like 90% of what you need to know with cranial nerves now, 50%, not 90, okay? This gives you the first letter of each of the cranial nerves, and it also gives you whether they're sensory motor or both, okay? Just a general helping. So go through, figure out their names, make the charts, start working on memorizing those. It'll help you immensely in lab, okay? And also, I give you a brief description of what each of them does in lab. You can start working on that on your own as well, okay? It's all kind of point and shoot stuff. Now, here's a picture of the brain, it would be good to get a little bit of a working knowledge of the location of the cranial nerves because we will go over the location on the models in the lab, okay? I think it's helpful when you're working on their location to go by the numbers, especially when you get into lab. It gets confusing on the lab test. I don't know if that would work for you or not. I go by the numbers from front to back. And then when I get into the cranial nerve exams, I used to always write that mnemonic down that I just gave you. I used to write their names down. So I had them right there. And then when I would look at the base of the brain, I would just go by number and it just made it easier for me, okay? So start to get a little bit familiar. The other thing that I could give you as a tip is many of the cranial nerves are around the pons. So if you look, you can see cranial nerve one is olfactory, that's easy. Two, optic, easy. Three, 
is going to be ocular motor that comes out of the top of the pons. Four, you can see, actually comes from around the back of the pons and it's teeny tiny. Okay, five comes out of, right out of the center of the pines and it's pretty thick. Six is going to be at the bottom of the pines. You know, so if you kind of think six, seven, eight come out of the bottom of the pines. If you kind of think of them in, in relationship to the pines and get used to saying, oh, three's on top, you know, six, seven, eight comes out of the bottom, it helps you somewhat, excuse me, to remember where they are. Okay? Okay. Um, good. Okay, so start working on that. That'll help you greatly in lab. And here's that chart for you. Okay. Gives you sensory motor. Um, what that, what PS fibers is, is parasympathetic. Don't worry about that part of the chart at this point. Okay, we'll talk about parasympathetic in a little bit. Spinal nerves, the easy peasy, 31 pairs of mixed nerves according to their point of origin. Eight cervical, hmm, a little confusing, right? Because there's only seven cervical, cervical vertebra. Keep in mind that the first cervical nerve comes out on top of C1, and the eighth cervical nerve comes out underneath C7. So you have a little bit of an extra nerve there. If you don't get that, I'll show it to you in lab. Okay, that's why you have eight cervical. 12 thoracic by lumbar, the rest are according to the size, except for co coccygeal. Okay, so 31 pairs. Here we go. Okay, we're looking at a transected view of the spinal cord. You can see the white matter is on the outside, the gray matter is on the inside. Now, what happens is we've got sensory nerves or nerve rootlets in the back at that dorsal root. We've got sensory on those ventral rootlets. Okay, you can call them rootlets or root because they're little teeny tiny ones and you can see those joined together to form a root. So the, the teeny tiny ones are rootlets. The one that's bigger that's getting towards the outside or towards that mixed spinal nerve is called a root. Okay, you could, uh, you know what, if you said either one, I'd be happy, okay? So dorsal and ventral roots will join together to form a mixed spinal nerve, okay? So dorsal and ventral roots mix, uh, join together to form a mixed spinal nerve, okay? Now, if you look at that spinal nerve, you look at the left side of the screen, you can see spinal nerve where they've joined together. That spinal nerve almost immediately separates, doesn't it, into what's called a dorsal ramus and a ventral ramus. Okay, don't let this blow you, your mind. It's actually very easy. The dorsal ramus goes to the back and it sends motor and sensory to the muscles around the spine. Okay, If you ever looked at somebody who has a really strong back and they arch back and you can see those back muscles popping out, that dorsal root gives motor and sensory to those nerves and to the skin in that area. So the ventral ramus is going to go where? It's going to go anywhere towards the front, the arms, the legs, and the chest. So even though that's, that seems confusing, it's so simple, okay? Dorsal ramus is going to go to the back. Ventral ramus is going to go to the front, okay? So dorsal ramus is going to go to the back muscles around the spine. Ventral ramus will go to the arms, the legs, and the chest, okay? Now this sympathetic trunk will get roots off of that mixed spinal nerve and also a little bit from the dorsal and the ventral ramus, okay? And what that sympathetic trunk is going to contribute to is towards our flight and fight system and our autonomic nervous system. That sympathetic trunk will actually run right next to your thoracic vertebra all the way up and down, and it provides the nerve fibers that provide sympathetic innervation, okay, for fight and flight. Okay, that's where they come from. Okay, so any questions about this whatsoever, please, please come see me. We've got all these nerves coming off, okay? And what we're looking at now is those ventral rami form what are called plexus or a plexi, okay? I've seen plexuses, I've seen plexi. A plexus, guys, is an intertwining of nerves 
that provide innervation or nerve supply to a specific area. So the cervical and the brachial plexus will take several of the cervical and actually one or two of the thoracic nerves and form a plexus that sends nerves down to the upper extremities. The lumbar and the sacral plexus will send nerves that will form a network that provides nerves to the pelvic basin and to the lower extremity. Okay. So a plexus is going to be a network of nerves. Okay. A plexus is singular, plexi or plexuses, or it's plural. Okay. I usually use them interchangeably mistakenly. But anyway, a plexus is going to be a network of nerves, and those nerves will intertwine to provide nerves to the upper and lower extremity. And I'll, I'll tell you why in just a second. Okay. You can see there's a cervical and a lumbar enlargement. That cervical and lumbar enlargement is there because we have simply more nerves coming off of it, more nerves coming out of it, so it's providing a bigger um, supply of nerves. Now, we also have intercostal nerves. Inter means between, costal means ribs. Intercostal nerves are very important. They're going to provide the nerve supply to the muscles that go between the ribs and help us with breathing. Intercostal nerves, okay? So spinal nerves are going to be those rami that I talked to you about, okay? The back is innervated by dorsal rami. So dorsal rami, and we just talked about this on the previous picture, okay? Dorsal rami are gonna innervate the back muscles. Vent ventral rami are gonna innervate everything else, okay? Those ventral rami are going to um, form those network of intertwined nerves. So cervical, brachial, lumbar, and sacral. And then those will provide innervation to the upper and lower extremity. Now, there's also ventral rami, which come off T2 to T12. Those are those intercostal nerves that I talked about. Okay, so don't let this flow your mind. This is exactly what we talked about. Those ventral rami are gonna come out and form intercostal nerves. They also form all the plexuses, the cervical, brachial, lumbar, and sacral plexuses, okay? And here's another picture, and I think this picture really helps, because you can see the dorsal ramus goes to the back muscles, the ventral ramus, you can see, shoots towards the front, okay? And then you can see that sympathetic trunk there as well. And then there's branches of them. I want you to know what I've spoken about so far. Yes, believe it, there's way more, okay? There's way, way more. Cervical plexus is going to come from the cervical spine. It's going to provide um, some branches to the head and the neck, but it also feeds the upper extremity. Now, there's one specific nerve that comes off the cervical plexus that's called the phrenic nerve, C3 and C4. Okay, The phrenic nerve, I would add C5 to that. And let me tell you why. C3, 4, 5 nerve roots are going to combine to form the phrenic nerve. The phrenic nerve goes to the diaphragm. Okay, so C3, 4, 5 keeps the diaphragm alive. The phrenic nerve is very important because it is what makes the diaphragm work. And the nerve rootlets that feed that are C3, 4, and 5, that's important to know because somebody has a fracture here, they can damage the phrenic nerve or the nerve roots that feed it and that person can stop breathing. That's why it's very important to always examine someone with either a CAT scan or an X-ray who's had a massive head trauma or spinal trauma, okay? There's also little branches that speed, feed the spinal accessory nerve. That's not really necessary for you to know at this point, okay? Here's a picture of the brachial plexus. This is every anatomy student's nightmare, so I'm actually gonna keep it simple, believe it or not. <laughs> this is simple. But the brachial plexus is going to take nerve rootlets from the cervical spine and the upper thoracic, T1. So the nerve roots that feed it are C5, C6, C7, C8, T1. And you can see it forms this really complex network of nerves that provide innervation to the upper extremity. 
The only subdivision of this that I want you to remember is that there are roots that feed it. As those roots move out laterally towards the arm, they form trunks. Those trunks turn into divisions as you move laterally. Those divisions turn, in, turn into cords. And then the cords, oh, I'm having a problem with that word today, cords turn into nerves. So roots, trunks, divisions, cords, from medial to lateral, and then nerves. The easy way to remember this is real tired drink coffee. Roots, trunks, divisions, cords, okay? So brachial plexus. And that's simply the roots, trunks, divisions, cords is how it's divided. And it's so complex that anatomists divided it down into these subdivisions to make it easier for it to be understood as to where you are when you're talking about a specific area, okay? So, but what you need to know is it comes from nerve rootlet C5, um, some cases C4 down to T1, okay? And then it's divided into those roots, trunks, divisions, and cords. Now the lumbar plexus is going to be L1 through L4. Nerve roots are going to feed it. It's always combined with the next um, plexus, which is the sacral plexus. People combine lumbosacral plexuses together because it's these two plexi that actually will feed the pelvic basin and the lower extremity. Okay, so lumbosacral plexus will be grouped together. Lumbar is L1 through L4, sacral is L4 through S4. Okay. Innervation of the skin includes what are called dermatomes. And dermatomes are the area of the skin innervated by a cutaneous branch. So the, if you can imagine those ventral rami came off, there's actually one little branch that'll go to the skin. Okay. And each level of the spinal cord, C2, C3, C4, C5, etc., send this little branch to the skin. Okay. Now some of these dermatomes overlap, so it's hard to identify them. Okay. But when we get into the upper and the lower extremity, there's very specific dermatomes in the upper and the lower extremity. And what that helps us to do is if you check sensation of those dermatomes, it can help give you an idea if there's damage to that nerve root. Okay. So the dermatomes, and I put that in the wrong place. Let's scoot ahead two slides. You can see if you look really closely that there's a C5 dermatome on the lateral aspect of the forearm and the top part of the shoulder. So if you blow a disc or a herniated disc that pushes on the C5 nerve rootlet and you were to test that patient and just sort of touch their arm lightly on the C5 dermatome in the right arm and then the C5 dermatome in the left arm, that could tell us if they have a difference, on, you know, so if they have damage to the right C5 nerve root, their sensation in that C5 dermatome is not gonna be as um, sensitive as it is on the left side. So what neurologists will do, let me bring you out for just a second. So here's the C5 nerve distribution for sensation of the skin, the dermatome of it. Here's C5 over here. So if you have a huge herniation that's pushing on this right C5 nerve rootlet, you'll come in and you'll have motor loss as well as sensation loss in the right C5 dermatome. So what neurologists will do, or, or any clinician really, is take a pin and poke you there. And if you have damage on that nerve root, let you won't feel it. Bang, 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 bang. They'll stab you with a little pin. But they'll take that pin and do it over here and you'll feel it. It'll hurt. It's one of our screenings when we're clinically working with people to try to rule out a herniation. Okay, you want to see how that sensation is. If the sensation is different from side to side, it's one of our clues that there might be damage to that nerve root. Then we would do some motor tests and some reflex tests as well. Okay, so it helps to give us, give us a whole clinical picture. So dermatomes are going to help us with that. Dermatomes are specific areas of the body, and we're going to look at those specific areas in lab and practice with them, that we have sensory innervation, and by testing those areas, we could have an idea if there's damage to those nerve roots, okay? Oh, 
This is a lot of information. We're going to take a break. I'm going to switch over to the next set of, of, of notes. Please, 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 if you need any help with this, I'd be more than happy. My advice to you would be to watch this a couple of times, look things up in the book if you don't understand it, and then write down your questions for me if you don't get it. All right? Time for a musical interlude. And we are going the distance. That's why I put this video in. <laughs> 